Thank you very much um, for having me. So my brief is to talk in some fairly general terms about recent research trends at the early medieval end of things, so basically what happens next. And I thought I'd start uh, in relatively familiar territory with what Karl Harper um, has to say in his 2011 book um, about it, what he presented as the key difference between late antique slavery in the fourth century um, which he sees very much as being in continuity with earlier times, very much not on the decline, and early medieval slavery around the time of Pope Gregory the Great in the late 6th century. And you still find plenty of references to slaves and slavery by this later point. But for Harper, the continuity is largely illusory. Um, so for him, all the main economic planks that had made Roman slavery distinctive were gone. So he regards Roman chattel slavery as having been made essentially unviable by the change from an economically highly complex late Roman society to early medieval societies that were economically very simple. Um, so these were societies that were much poorer, much less monetized, with much less market exchange, less profoundly unequal access to economic resources, and therefore also societies that had neither the need nor the ability uh, to support as many slaves doing as many different productive and non-productive jobs. So for Harper, um, what makes early medieval societies and economies, and therefore slavery, different from late antique society and late antique slavery, is that you have much less production for a market, and this affects all production in bulk, crafts, agriculture, all of that, much less extensive sub-elite uses for slaves, because so much becomes about subsistence agriculture. The disappearance of the super-rich, uh, whom Harper sees as having owned a very significant proportion of all slaves under the empire. And the disappearance of an urban middling type, um, which Harper sees as another key element of demand sustaining Roman chattel slavery. So you're left with just relatively rich, often militarized regional elites, on the one hand, and on the other, mostly uh, people who are at subsistence level. So all this means that slave markets in the West also very quickly become small and essentially regional in reach. Um, and Harper concludes his section on the West, which he sees much, you know, he generally sees in the West much more disruption in patterns of slavery than in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, by saying the end of Roman slavery was not a vanishing act or an evolutionary mutation, it was a systems collapse. The slave society of the Romans fragmented and became a multitude of societies with slaves. So this sees early medieval slavery as simply a return to something more within a kind of pre-modern norm. Uh, so some slaves, not that many of them, uh, not by the mere fact of their existence making a massive structural difference to social relations or the economy. And actually, I actually don't see any fundamental problem with this reading, and I don't think that very many early medievalists <coughs> would either. The only bit of it that some early medievalists might take exception to is the reliance on the slave society versus society with slaves uh, dichotomy itself, which we've uh, already discussed, and which has been very strongly defended by both Harper and Walter Scheidel uh, since in this book. Historians and anthropologists who work on societies that don't effectively clear the bar for being slave societies, tend not to like that distinction very much, uh, on the basis that even relatively small numbers and a smallish economic, economic impact don't necessarily turn slavery into a second-order phenomenon. Um, so it can still be fundamental socially, conceptually, in terms of gender ideology, racial divides, and so on. Personally, I don't object to it. I just regard it as a distinction that's useful for some purposes and not for others. So clearly there was something special about Roman slavery. And if its historians want a concept to express that, I don't really see why specialists of other periods should object, um, as long as it, doesn't turn, it, it as doesn't turn into a kind of bar that you have to clear in order to establish significance in the first place. And implicitly, I think the distinction is still acknowledged anyway by the fact that medievalists have found increasingly useful and fruitful reference points, not with Rome or with the modern era, as used to be the case, but instead with other societies that also look less like them. But in terms of the basic content of the comparison, I really don't think Harper's point would meet with a lot of disagreement among early medievalists. And the main reason 
is that actually the whole issue of continuity from Rome now is beginning to look like a much, much less important question than it used to be. <coughs> and this is obviously a spectacular fall from grace, because for decades and decades and decades, the conversation was all about when did Roman slavery end? Um, so this was the title of the article by Mark Bloch, Comment et pourquoi finit l'esclavage antique, which was published posthumously after he was killed by the Gestapo, uh, and which defined the entire topic for medievalists. And it's really quite striking how quickly the question of continuity from Rome has just receded into the background just in the last few years. Um, in the 90s and 2000s, when people thought that there were vast numbers of slaves in the early Middle Ages, they tended to be in a minority. It was held as an eccentric uh, opinion to have, uh, at least in Anglophone historiography. And they also tended to think of it very much in terms of survival of Roman practices, um, even if not survival of the kind of entire nexus that had given Roman slavery some of its more unique traits. So up to recently, when you saw slaves in early medieval sources, uh, a kind of normal response was to go continuity from Rome, um, especially if you're working in France or in the US. And back then, it would have been very easy to find early medievalists who would have been very upset by what Harper has to say about this. Um, but in the last 20, especially the last 10 years or so, things have started to look very different. And paradoxically, it's actually since we've started as a field to become less and less convinced that slavery disappeared at all in Europe during our period, um, that the issue of continuity from Rome has started to seem less and less important. And that's because the most striking <coughs> concentrations of evidence relating to slavery in the period 500 to 1000 have very little to do with the Roman tradition. And uh, a real kind of early milestone was Michael McCormick's um, amazingly rich book, um, Origins of the European Economy, from 2001. And as ancient historians, many of you will know it very well and strongly informs um, Harper's book. And its theme was the transition from the ancient to the medieval Mediterranean. So it may seem like quite a weird place to start um, if you're thinking about to start to document this kind of historiographical disengagement from Roman precedents. But for early medievalists specifically, I think its key impact was more in highlighting the importance in terms of volume of the slave trade to the east, um, to the Abbasid Empire, um, and um, it didn't come out that well, but yeah, the Abbasid Empire. Yeah. Um, from and Baghdad from around the middle of the 8th century. And this was a trade in captives taken from Slavic Central Europe over there. Um, and McCormick sees Venice in particular as playing a key role in it. Cordoba also became an important center of demand, which is why it's there, um, though more so later in the 10th century. So I think there was, there still is, quite a lot of skepticism about McCormick's wider claim that the slave trade was therefore a key motor for the influx of silver into the Carolingian Empire and that it was largely responsible for fueling the Carolingian economic takeoff. But his dossier of evidence on the trade itself was extremely compelling and it did get people used to the idea that slave taking and slave trading would still have been part of the reality of living <coughs> during these centuries. And in fact, more so than in centuries closer to Rome, like the seventh. So whereas before the name of the game had been to look for slaves more intensively in sources from the 6th and 7th centuries, now these more immediate post-Roman centuries start to look more like a temporary slump between two peaks, so just not located in the same places geographically. And what McCormick was sketching out was the southern Mediterranean counterpart to another trade axis, which had been known about for a lot longer, and this one involves Vikings along a northern arc going roughly from Ireland um, there to the Eurasian steppe, north of the Black Sea. And it got going around the same time in the mid 8th century and supplied the same demand, first in the Abbasid Empire, especially in the 9th century, and then the Samanids in what is now Iran, Afghanistan and Uzbekistan in the 10th. Um, and this is just to give you uh, a rare contemporary depiction of Vikings um, from Ishmanok in Scotland. The cuteness is likely unintentional. Um, so this northern slave trade had been known about for a long time, and it's only really come onto the radar of historians who are not specialists of Eastern Europe in the last 10 to 15 years or so. So essentially, this is information that existed, but has now become much, much more mainstream. 
Numismatists and specialists of Eastern Europe already knew about the simply vast hordes of silver found in Scandinavia and Eastern Europe, containing hundreds of thousands of silver dirhams, as well as hack silver. So as in the spectacular um, Spillings hoard um, here, which was found on the island of Gotland, where a lot of these hoards have been found. And on its own, this one contains 66 kilos of silver, including 14,000 dirhams. Um, and slaves are known to have been a key element of what was being traded there. Um, helpfully, there's plenty of texts written by Arab geographers um, that discuss and document the slave trade in those regions directly. And the silver is also just much more undeniable as an indicator than it is in the Mediterranean because you can just see it's there, it's in Dirams. Um, whereas in, the Western, in Western Southern Europe, the fact that there's a lot of reminting makes the whole issue much trickier. And uh, mostly you're dealing with virtual coins and documents and it's often unclear what exactly it is that they're referring to. So the case is simply overwhelming from, for the North, even more so than for what McCormick was talking about. But I think indirectly, McCormick's book <coughs> did play a big role in making early medievalists take notice of this who don't work specifically on Eastern Vikings. It's only relatively recently that there have been attempts to quantify this trade more exactly, to try to model what this might mean in terms of scale and impact, but the answer generally is agreed to be huge. Um, there's a project in Oxford called uh, Dirhams for Slaves, um, which uh, was led by Mary Kankoviak and Jonathan Shepard, uh, which has made a lot of progress on this issue uh, and did so in the 2010s. So, not all of this is new, but much of it is. But either way, it's only really started to make a real difference in how people have thought about slavery in the early Middle Ages um, in the last decade or so. <coughs> Clearly, another important context for this, um, the reason why other early medievalists have started to kind of um, sit up and start listening, has been the boom in global history, which has fostered a lot more engagement with what used to be thought of as peripheral regions, uh, like Scandinavia in this period, and also what was going on in the Muslim world. And the, the immense current interest in all historical fields in writing global history has brought long distance traders and Vikings in particular much more center stage. Another reason for this greater engagement might be an outcome, I don't know, is that for a long time Viking activity in Eastern Europe was considered as relatively divorced from what was going on in the West, in England, Scotland and Ireland. Um, but this has also changed in the last 10 to 15 years or so and Western and Eastern Viking routes are also now seen as much more connected, much more integrated, um, all through the arc. So all this is contributing to a very different emerging picture of this period, where if you're interested in slavery in early medieval Europe, the obvious time to look for slavery is no longer the immediate post-Roman centuries, uh, but the mid-8th to 10th centuries. And the obvious place to look is not the old ex-imperial heartlands of Western Europe, Gaul or Italy, um, but areas that had never been part of the Roman Empire in the first place. So it's changed the center of gravity and sort of reversed the, the, the balance. So whereas before the big story was the exploitation of labor, the place of slavery, more generally on free status within that, slavery as a topic, and it really is starting to become a field, medieval slavery in the way it kind of never was before, um, has now become much more focused on trade. Um, which before was regarded as a much more marginal phenomenon. So this has pushed the discussion of early medieval slavery away from the lands of the Carolingian estate surveys that people had been mainly preoccupied with um, in the 2000s and in the 2010s even. And instead, towards these frontier region, regions with the Muslim world, like Spain, southern Italy, Sicily, and also very far western or northern regions like Ireland, Iceland, Scandinavia, and Eastern Europe. So, and this has also um, significantly shifted the skill set required, actually. So historians who before might have taken it upon themselves to answer the question, when did Roman slavery end, are rarely equipped with the languages necessary to deal um, either with the sources, so Arabic, Old Irish, Old Norse, or Church Slavonic, um, or the historiography, Russian, Swedish, Polish, um, um, of this other trait. And they, really I should say we, because I'm very much included in this, um, also specialized in different working methods from the ones needed for these areas, because in the East and North in particular, so much of the information is exclusively derived from material evidence. So all this newfound incompetence is very much par for the course and will be sadly familiar to anybody who is interested in taking a more global approach to their own specialism. 
But clearly all this needs to have an impact on our work, for those of us who don't work directly on it. So now that we're all operating within this wider geographical scope, even if you don't and just can't work on this stuff directly, once you're aware that there was this giant current sweeping people along towards the east, you just you can't unsee it. And it doesn't change the evidence that's already been looked at for so long in Gaul, Italy, and so on, but certainly it puts it in a different context. And I think a key desideratum for future research is to try to connect more these two discussions. So the one about this massive slave trade to the east and the older one about society, economy, and labor exploitation within Europe, which is the one that I feel more competent to contribute to. So at the moment, they really have not yet been integrated. Um, McCormick, back in 2001, did propose this very strong link between this new Mediterranean slave trade and uh, traditionally mainstream early medieval regions by presenting it as fueling the economic upturn there. Um, but I think this has interested more than it has convinced um, specialists of the field. Um, certainly, there is a much less clear case for this than there is for the importance of the slave trade in itself. And since then, there really hasn't been that much that much by way of an attempt to connect the two. I certainly include myself in this, because even though I did, uh, as I mentioned, publish a book about early medieval slavery, mainly in its Roman provinces a few years ago, um, in which I, I argued essentially that it should be seen as its own thing rather than in genealogical perspective from Rome, um, which is a perspective where you can either decline or stay the same, but not change or do other things. Um, that even though the demand for slaves was lower, that the economic and non-economic uses for slaves were a lot less diverse, um, early medieval people were nevertheless doing things with slavery that were quite creative and new. That is, they were labeling people as slaves for a very wide range of purposes to negotiate a great variety of different kinds of social relations. Um, and also, in contrast with earlier slavery, which had been supplied chiefly via commercial means, this more often involved local internal sources of unfree labor. And I also argued that there was nevertheless more slavery about for a lot longer than it looked, um, though increasingly it was no longer how elites who were at the economic cutting edge supplied their own labor needs, which I think is one of the really key contrasts with the Roman world. Um, so there was more like, there were likely more of it in peasant households, but very few sources care enough about them to let us know. So I think I, I do feel that all these points do hold. Uh, that is, they may be wrong, but I don't think anyone, that anything new has come up lately that invalidates them particularly. Um, but I did have a chapter about the slave trade, but to the extent that I discussed capture and trade of slaves, especially to the East, um, it was mostly to treat it as a different topic um, and to say that it didn't make that much difference in terms of the logic of labor exploitation. So effectively that it didn't impinge that much on my real topic, which was how and why people labeled other people as slaves, and what it was that this helped them to do that they couldn't otherwise have done. And now I really think I should have wondered more about what difference it made that there was this huge captive taking and moving of bodies happening all around the regions I was looking at. My own view is that the Carolingian Empire in Gaul and Italy and Germany mostly engaged with it quite distantly. So certainly Carolingian kings taxed this trade as it went through to Spain, for instance, or to Venice. And this could, this could add up to quite a lot. There is certainly textual evidence to show that. Um, so there's a Carolingian list of tolls surviving from the early 10th century that mentions Slavic slaves and Rus traders. But beyond that, I sort of don't see that the evidence exists that would warrant picturing the Carolingians as key movers and shakers there. Which is not to say, of course, they did have plenty of other ways to be horribly oppressive people, but that's just another <laughs> story. Um, at the same time, there evidently was awareness of the phenomenon within the empire, and obviously some Franks must have taken part in it. So it's worth thinking about the wider cultural impact as well. So being enslaved, being swept off somewhere among pagans or in Constantinople, which is hardly better, um, was evidently a fate that people feared everywhere. Uh, in Ireland, in Sicily, it was feared for extremely good reason. Um, there are saints' lives from both places that had this as their starting point, uh, in that it was not at all unlikely to happen. In the Frankish kingdoms, it seems to have been much, much less likely. Um, of course, you would expect anywhere crossed by a major slave trading route, um, conveying captives, among other things, for instance, from Prague to Spain, 
that that would sweep along a few unfortunate locals along with it. Um, presumably traders, though, were quite careful not to take too many risks on the route and alienate the contacts they had there. But even if the risk of actually being kidnapped and traded far away was small, the hold on the imagination could still be very powerful. And the works of an uh, intensely unlikable man called Agobard of Lyon are, do make, I think, quite a good example. So he was Archbishop of Lyon in the first half of the ninth century, and also an extreme anti-Jewish polemicist. Uh, and he conjured up the fear of Jews kidnapping Christian children and selling them off in Cordoba. This was clearly a bogeyman story because he writes about this to the emperor. And he's only able to point to two cases, real or not, um, at about 25 years of distance from each other and across quite a big region, and even though he's really out to look for them. So there is this imaginative hold there, even if the quantitative basis seems to me to be quite slight. Um, and probably regions along river routes like the Rhone or the Rhine had a fundamentally different experience of this slave trade. But it may have fueled the imagination in other ways too. Um, so there were bishops that assembled at a synod of Mont Paris in 845, um, who complained about pagan slaves being taken to Muslim regions where their souls would be lost and where they would only add to Muslim military capability. It would be much better, they said, to force merchants to sell them in Franken. This never happened, but perhaps you can, I mean, there, there was never a policy forcing merchants to do this. Um, but perhaps you can detect there a certain wistfulness, even envy, at seeing the fulfilling of this really large-scale demand at courts abroad. And the bishops were imagining themselves as better masters as the, at the potential consumer end of the slave trade, even though in practice local markets could never have been able to compete with the prices in Venice or in Cordoba, which is why they also imagined it through forced sales. Of course, you could still buy and sell people in the Carolingian Empire, but by then, this form of slave recruitment had become anyway increasingly irrelevant um, to the wealthiest lords. The Council of Montparis, I think, is a, is, a, in Paris, is a very interesting moment because of this sense in the bishops' minds, however unrealistic, that maybe Caroline and Franke could have moved back once again into being a society with lots of chattel slaves who had been obtained commercially, as Roman Gaul had been, although presumably they were thinking more of contemporary Muslim Spain. And the fact that it was by then such an improbable plan also shows quite how long the distance traveled since had been. So I'll stop here, but all of which is to say, I think it's, it is worth thinking more about different ways of relating to that completely new pattern of slave trading, including relatively unrealistic way, ways of relating to it, and the kind of hold that it kept having throughout Europe and not just in the areas directly affected.